this session where we are welcoming two fabulous people, um, Ajay Amalayan, who is co-founder and director of MAS Holdings. And Ajay, if you could just unmute for a second and just uh, say a word so people can see you. Hi guys, I'm Ajay Amalian. I'm based out of Sri Lanka and um, co-founder of MS Holdings. Uh, we founded this company by two brothers, uh, Mahesh and Sherab, and that's how MAS was coined. It was the initials of our three names. That's how MAS was coined. Thank it you. also means gold <laughs> in Bahasa, <laughs> Indonesia. It does. <laughs> All right. Subject Wonderful. And I also want to welcome Kunal Amalian, who, Amalian, who is Ajay's son. Kunal is the, the co-founder of Runway Kit. Um, Kunal, and Kunal is also Babson graduate 2012. Can you just uh, unmute yourself for a second, um, Kunal, and just say a quick hello so we can see you. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Kunal Amalian, and um, I am uh, based out of Colombo, Sri Lanka, um, Babson, uh, class of 2012. Um, and um, I, um, I've been in the family business for the last seven years. I co-founded uh, Runway Kit. Very nice um, meeting you guys. I'm very excited about today. Wonderful. So as I mentioned um, a minute ago, and some of you who joined since, I am Laura Union. I'm the executive director of Babson's Institute for Family Entrepreneurship. and um, one of the things that I want to share, and um, Benjapan, you can um, go ahead and just put up the, we're going to have slides just for a, a couple of minutes. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I want to share is that you might have noticed that we didn't, I did not say I was running an institute for family business. I said I was running an institute for family entrepreneurship. And we're very, very deliberate about these words here at Babson. The reason why we're deliberate about using the word family entrepreneurship is that we understand that when it comes to families, the entrepreneurship rests within the family and not within any one particular business that they might be operating at any point in time. The way we think about family entrepreneurship is that it's really at the nexus of the entrepreneurial opportunity, the way the family functions together that allows them to access those entrepreneurial opportunities together, and the self-reflectivity that allows the individual members of that family to be able to navigate successfully and contribute to the overall family functioning and, entre and entrepreneurship. So this is really where we're focusing today is on this nexus of family entrepreneurship. And if you can go to the next slide, please, um, Carmen. So, um, you know, one of the things that many of you may be aware of, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurial families and family businesses is that, um, family businesses comprise over 80% actually of the businesses all around the world. And this is data that's been recently confirmed um, through the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which is a, it's, it's a global research initiative that Babson is a co-founder of. Um, so we know that more than 80% of all the businesses in the world are family businesses. Um, additionally, I, some people may be aware of this, but this was something new to me when I started this work about three years ago, to realize that those entrepreneurial families and family businesses are driving at least 70% of global GDP. In fact, this data point that we have here is from Family Firm Institute, and their official data point is that family businesses drive 70 to 90% of global GDP. So we know that, that family businesses are the predominant form of business, and we know how important they are in, in the global economy. But what's new, what we're gonna be talking about today, is some additional information that came from this recent Global Entrepreneurship Monitor survey, which is that, in fact, it turns out that 75% of startups around the world are actually family businesses. So this is really a testament to the power of um, entrepreneurial families, the impact that they currently have and can have um, in the world. And the question is, you know, how, how, how can we foster ways for, um, for family startups to be more successful? What are some of the tips? What are some of the tricks? What are some of the ways that, that families can maximize their capacity to have success in their entrepreneurship. And this is what we're gonna be exploring today through the story of the Amalian family um, and through their business, um, MAS Holdings, 
um, and through the story of, of Kunal and how he has created an entrepreneurship startup. So um, I'll just say a couple of things actually about the session. And while I'm doing that, actually, Carmen is going to put up um, just a quick poll. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to have um, just a, a conversation um, with, with Kunal and Ajay. And um, as, as we talk, um, very much encourage um, anyone who likes to uh, put a, a question in the chat or to share your own experience because we want to learn from you uh, as well as as well as um, as well as from them. Um, so very much encourage you to jump in um, when you when you put your question in the chat. Then uh, when we have an opportunity, we'll call on you and you and you can just ask your your question directly. Um, so uh, Carmen, were you able to put up the poll? The poll is up. Okay, super. Okay, I actually can't see it, but maybe others can. Yeah, uh, people are polling now. They are great. Okay, mm -hmm. super. Okay. All right. Um, so we're we're gonna um, we're, we're just gonna have this this great conversation. Um, people can join in. Um, there'll be time for um, for for questions and comments uh, uh, later in the session as well. If, if we don't get to them uh, while you know while we're having our conversation, the session is gonna officially end um, at eleven. Um, you might have noticed that the blocked time was um, until eleven fifteen. The reason for that is so there's time afterwards for people who would like to maybe stay, maybe ask a question they didn't get to ask, have some more conversation. So we'll have some kind of casual time to be able to, um, to chat after, after 11 o'clock. Um, and uh, I think we can go ahead and probably close the poll. What do you think, Carmen? Okay. Are you able to show the results? Can you see it? I actually cannot see it. I don't know why. Uh, can everyone else see the results? Yes, yes, we can. So you guys yeah, I just saw it for a few seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, so, I, can, I can tell you, Laurie. You yeah, can. tell me the results. So, 36%, uh, 39 people have a family startup, and then 31%, um, 34 people, may launch a family startup in the future. And the majority, 44%, uh, 47 people, want to learn more about families. Okay, so whatever category, this is fabulous to know, actually, that um, it looks like more than a third of people who are, you who are currently on, um, on this call actually have their own experience with, um, with a family startup. So we'd love to hear your shared experience. Um, would love to hear your, your questions for those who may launch a family startup in the future um, or for those who just want to learn. So, so let's jump right in. Um, and, um, and let's start with you, Ajay. I actually have you on mute just at the moment, um, so you don't have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> so, you know, so Ajay, you know, as we had a great conversation, you shared with me that, um, that as a young man, you and your two brothers um, had an existing family business. And it was a very successful business. And, and actually, your, your older brother was, was the oldest in, in this generation and was expected to step in and take that leadership role. But instead, you decided to do a startup on your own, to, to not, not follow that business and, and do your own thing. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about you know, why, why did you do that? Tell us a little bit about the founding story of the company and, and where it is today. Yeah, that's a good question, Lloyd. You know, family businesses, we were part of a larger family business that was very successful. Several industries within it, there was real estate, hotels, textile mills, apparel companies, um, a good mix of businesses and very successful, which was actually started by my grandfather. So, Ironically, normally, the, it's the third generation that gets restless and wants to get out. So, um, ironically, it was the same with us too. You know, and it was a successful family business. And there's a good side to it and the bad side to it too. The good side to it is that you are in a stable environment and you're in a comfortable environment. And the bad side to it is that you're in too comfortable a place. 
And so your likelihood of getting out and starting something on your own is very unlikely too, because it's a comfortable space. It is a successful business too. Mm, but over a period of time, uh, it was a business that was started by my grandfather and my father and his two other brothers. Very successful. However, as we were finishing school and went overseas to continue our studies, there was no kind of knowledge or thinking of a succession plan. If the next generation is coming in, how should we induct them into this business? What should we be doing? Are there rules, are there guidelines of how they can enter and who can enter as well? Because it was a, we were a large set of cousins as well, almost 25 of us. So um, they should have had some kind of plan as to how the next generation was getting in. But they were all entrepreneurs, businessmen who were very successful. So that whole thought process of succession plan was not part of their game at all. And uh, we lost our father when we were quite young. We were in our teens. So um, we also and our uncles were looking after taking care of us, but certain problems kept coming up. And a lot of the issues were not getting resolved. And my two brothers were the first two elder guys to join the business. And my uncle's children hadn't joined the businesses yet. So they were not facing the problems head on as we were. And so as a result of that, we felt that a lot of the issues were not getting resolved. There was no induction, there was no plan, there was no method, and there was no process. So that created a certain amount of frustration. Both my brothers were in the business, Mahesh and Sharad were in the business. I graduated as an engineer and I came back and they said, don't join the business. Things are not very stable here, don't join the business. I was working as an engineer in an engineering company in the dockyard. And when things were kind of brewing with the family and there was unpleasantness, you know, the, the, the uh, kind of conflict we had was actually, do we argue with our uncles who have been taking care of us all the time? Or do we just get out and start something of our own and keep the peace in the family? Mm -hmm. That was the conflict. Okay. And <clears throat> because don't get me wrong, they were doing the best they could and the best they knew how. Okay. And uh, so we had this conflict amongst us. And as and when things, issues were not getting resolved, it was throwing the seeds of separation in us. And our dinner time conversations were always about the issues that the two brothers were having in the family business. And of course I was out of it, so it didn't bother me so much, but I was listening to these conversations every day at dinner time. And so was my mom too. So um, over a period of time, it was just brewing up. But the spark, you know, there is some for an event like this to take place. There is always a spark that triggers it off. 
and so you have a conflict and then you have a spark and the spark was that one of my younger uncles challenged us and said you guys don't have the guts to get out of this umbrella of comfort <laughs> and security so don't just bullshit us and threaten us you will never get out okay and when he said that we got even more stronger in our conviction that we may have to take care of our own destiny all right yes the uncles mean well but their thinking was so very different their thinking was it's interesting their thinking was you have a roof over your head you have clothes to wear and you have food on the table so what's your problem and our conflict was that we needed a different lifestyle we needed we had different aspirations and ambitions which they didn't understand yeah, this is okay. this is um this is very um uh, powerful ajay because what i hear you saying is that um you know the the older generation didn't really understand or maybe they're I, I i would say kind of what you shared when we talked before is that actually what you guys wanted maybe wasn't um even fully considered it wasn't it was assumed that that you would be stepping in taking the leadership role of the business and so your your wants and your needs um were not considered um and you also shared that that take making this break with with the family business was difficult and painful because it it meant um maybe disappointing some people um so i'll stop and you can go off you can go off mute <laughs> you're on mute ajay so um yeah uh, so what happened was that we knew we wanted to charter our own kind of destiny and they couldn't figure out that we had just graduated we had a different thinking we were dating and we were we were getting married my eldest brother uh, was getting married mahesh was getting married so as a young family we had certain needs and aspirations for himself and his wife but this was something quite new to my father's generation that these are needs that you can just adjust to okay uh, and uh, that but so it was actually a conflict of our needs and their perception mm -hmm. of what our needs would be yeah that's so interesting so and, and tell, us, tell us how you about how you kind of what were the how did how did you do the startup what was the what was the business like in the beginning okay yes the vision in the beginning? so so when we decided to get out um we didn't want we wanted to get out also lori with the blessings of our uncles and my mother too right because it was a very close knit family and we learned a lot from the family too so we didn't want to break away with a lot of acrimony and things like that so and as i told you at that time mahesh was the eldest male in the family and he was uh positioned to take over the business um so the expectation was one thing what their expectation of him was one but his expectation of what he wanted was something else so the when we said we want to get off the, out of the business it was something that they just didn't want to listen to but we gave them 6 months we tried talking to them on several occasions and finally it was my father's second brother 
who actually came down one day and had a long chat with us and said, okay, boys, if you want to get out, that's fine, right? What are you going to do? How sure of you or what? And he was in the best interest, in the best of our interest, in trying to understand what we were trying to do and uh, how we wanted to settle down. We also didn't want to get into a business that would be in conflict with the family too. Okay? That was important. So our initial plan was to start uh, a business of manufacturing label tags. That was not a business that the family was into, uh, but we were just, and it was a, our, our aspirations and goals were not that great and magnificent. Never in our wildest dreams did we think that we would be a $2 billion company. No way, no way. But we just wanted to get into a business that would keep us and our families comfortable and happy. So, um, yeah, it was very important that we don't get into a conflicting business. However, with the limited bank facilities that we had and the limited amount of money we had, we just couldn't, the rupee devalued or something like that happened and we couldn't afford to buy those weaving machines for those labels. The only mach machines we could afford to buy were the basic Juki 555 machines. Um, and we bought 20 machines, 25 machines, employed 40 people and started the business 30 years and, ago. And, that, yeah, and that's amazing. I think so one, you know, one important thing that you said is that, um, you know, first of all, one of the things we, of course, we talk about um, in, in, in the IFE and Babson overall is entrepreneurial leadership, which is really around deploying a lot of the emotional intelligence skills to be successful in, in leadership and business. And it's more important in family entrepreneurship than I, I think in, you know, in any other situation. And you've just described um, how you navigated this very difficult situation of you know, leaving a family business where the expectations of you were very high um, with, with a tremendous amount of emotional intelligence. Um, and, um, and, the, and the other thing that you um, have just described is how you started a business on the edge of the existing family business. So leveraging the knowledge, the contacts of the family to be able to launch your um, yeah. initiative. And, and tell us a little bit about what, what is this, this business like today? Well, um, yeah, I said we started with almost a $10,000 equivalent in rupees. $10,000, 25 machines and 40 employees 30 years ago. Today, I have no count of how many machines we have. We employ almost 100,000 people and we are a $2 billion company. The largest employer in Sri Lanka outside of the government, right? So the largest private sector company. And uh, very proud to say that we are the number one choice for employment too. That's so amazing. which is, a, that's, that's for me really great. That's fabulous. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm going to make a little bit of a, uh, a judgment, judgment, which I hope is okay, um, which is that you know, I, I'm sure there may have been some luck involved, there always is, who knows, um, in, in terms of the success you've achieved. Um, but my judgment is that um, the way that you and your brothers operate together, which is actually building on this tremendous, uh, I would say, I think we call it emotional intelligence, um, but built on a, built on a strong, a strong value system, um, the, the way that you operate together and the way that then ideates out into the organization, um, I'm just going to make a judgment that that's a significant reason why you believe um, what you Oh, have. yes. And, and, and I'd love to Yes, go ahead. Why do you use the word luck? Lots of people tell that to us, but I have a definition for luck. Luck to me is when hard work meets an opportunity. Yes. Something positive comes out of it. 
Yes. And that's for me is the luck. Because you can have an opportunity and if you haven't worked hard for it, you will never be able to deliver on it. Okay? Sometimes you work really hard, but you don't have the opportunity. That happens too. So it's a combination of two things that has to take place at the same time. So for me, that's luck. And um, for us, luck came in the form of our partnership with the Limited Inc. in the US. Mm -hmm. We knew a gentleman by the name of Martin Trust. And we, have, we, we, we were doing, Mahesh was doing business with him. And he wanted to start a factory in Sri Lanka. We were, in, we were one of the partners that were introduced to him. He started three joint ventures in Sri Lanka. We were one of them. And with that, what's interesting is it was, he was an entrepreneur himself, right? Self-made man. Went a lot by God too. And the first two projects we had we did with him were two manufacturing sites. He had a business that was the sourcing arm of the limited. So it sourced for Victoria Secret Express at that time belonged to limited. Abercrombie belonged to the limited. So he was sourcing for all of those. And we were manufacturing with him. So um, the first two joint ventures we had was just on a handshake. Absolute trust. He put in money, we put in money, and we got started. It was only when we were getting into the third joint venture, which was a much larger business, that the Limited Inc. started asking him, what is your exit clause? What are the legal terms, etc." And then when we saw, we said we had no legal terms whatsoever. It was just trust, faith, a lot of hard work. And um, I think honesty in doing business together. So it, it was just on a handshake that we started. That's fabulous. And, and Ajay, I'm wondering, you know, um, I think we've all heard cases of siblings who get in business together and the relationships are damaged or sometimes even you know, irreparably destroyed, which is you know, obviously a terrible outcome. But yet you and your two brothers, you worked together for over 30 years. Um, and, and, and as you so aptly said, your, your success is this, you know, the nexus of, of, of luck um, and, 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 and preparation. And a lot of that preparation, I do think, is in your relationships and how you work together. So can you share with us, what, what are some of the things that, um, you know, that, that, that you guys do together, the way you work together, that have been that foundation of what has made your um, major luck? Okay, so, um, you know, for us, our father passed away when we were teenagers. And if you, if you look at our culture, mainly a South Asian culture, the siblings are supposed to look after each other. And so three of us took care of each other and we bonded and were quite close. So that was the starting point. Uh, another thing that was important was that we all had different skills. All three of us had very different skills. And Mahesh was clearly the visionary. He was the eldest, he was clearly the visionary and we respected him for that, right? And we didn't dispute if he was saying, this is the path to go, right? And he was, very convinced in his explanation, we would go ahead with it. So he was a visionary and he was our strongest marketing person. Okay. Sharad was the finance guy. He was a number cruncher. He was a finance guy and very good with operations.
and i was being the engineer was very good at the back end in manufacturing and production so i handled manufacturing and production and also hr my people skills were better than my two brothers so i was handling hr too and uh, so we three of us had very distinct roles to play and i was the only right brain <laughs> my two my two other other two brothers have not an ounce of creativity in them at all okay so it was just that we were three different personalities we respected each other that mutual respect is such an important piece because you give them a task to do if let's take it to shara if he was suggesting something which had some financial kind of discipline in involved we would just trust his judgment give him the space to make the decisions support him and back him right through right um and so was with my case if i wanted something to be done in production i wanted to invest in new machinery or things like that i was given all the support right um and if mahesh wanted to get into a new joint venture we supported him in that so he was the visionary so three of us were very had different skills and we were good at what we were doing and we respected so, each other so one of the things that you know sometimes can get in the way when um you know siblings working together doesn't work as well is where that sibling rivalry that you know often exists as children then suddenly um shows up in a business environment and you know i think we you know we all have a, a kind of human need to be right um there've actually been some books written about this topic um and so when that need to be right um and just need one second i just to get rid of that back feed back feed um when that um when that need to be right trans transitions from you know what happens as kids into a business environment where suddenly it's like who's right about the marketing plan or who's right about the production plan um that's where often those relationships can you know can really become so deeply strained so i i think that um you know the, the way that you i would say uh, you know uh, approach it without ego um in with respect for each other and and focusing i in my and and from my sense um i would say that it, it it sounds like you may you may you probably still have that human need to be right but the question is what do you what do you want to be right about and what you want to be right about i think it sounds like it's the the you know the collective success and 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 your values and i'm, I'm i think you can take yourself back off mute tell me if you agree with what i just said you have to take yourself back off mute that's a question that we've been asked so many times how do you three brothers just get along i mean don't you guys have a fight at least so um we decided that we will fight in private and we <laughs> have a meeting on thursday morning every week and we've been doing this for almost 5 we are 5 or 8 almost 10 years now and we discuss any contentious issues that are there in the business and we align ourselves at those meetings to ensure that the the leadership knows that the three brothers are like so one doesn't play the against us against the other two the leadership knows that the three brothers are aligned on this and deep gives them then the kind of support or the strength that they need to as well so we have our fights for sure but we do that within closed doors and you share with me that you have a a key guy in principle in your decisions that unifies you um which is sorry you, come again you you shared that you have a key guiding principle for all of yes. the decisions that you oh, make yes, yes. in those in that private meeting lori from the time we started our business the key philosophy was 
is this the right thing to do? That was so important. It's even important today, 30 years later, for us. So from the first decision we made to air condition our factories, to provide transport to the workforce, to provide them with a free breakfast, to provide them with subsidized lunch. These were team members who were working so very hard to ensure that we deliver on the commitments that we have made, right? So all of those things happen because the first question we ask is, is the right thing to do? Also the right thing to do by our partners, by our stakeholders, by our supply chain, by the workforce, all of that. So that was one of the guiding principles we had. And Very I think, strong I think, that's, I think that's super important that you have um, those um, that unified guiding principle. And I think with that, because I'm not doing a very good job of managing time here, I want to turn to Kunal. Um, and, um, and Kunal, I'd, I'd love to just um, learn a little bit from you about your entry. You know, the, it, when, when you entered the family business, it was already of you know, similar magnitude that it is today. You graduated from Babson. Um, and, and, you, and you had a particular journey, um, which, which, which I love how you described it. You described your journey in joining the business as, as a journey of appreciation. And I just, I can't tell you how many times I've used that since you first shared that with me um, about two and a half years ago. Um, but, um, but, but, but I'd love it if you, if you could share a little bit about um, what, what, what was your process in, in, in joining this, uh, this family business? Sure, sure. Um, so, um, so, I'm, so I'm the first of the next generation to, um, to join the MAS family business. And um, at that time, it was quite a bold decision for me to um, move back to Sri Lanka from Boston because I was uh, quite comfortable. I was living in a comfortable life in Boston after graduation at Babson. Um, and um, there were there were some prerequisites um, to enter the business based on the constitution that we had. And um, it was quite a structured process, which was actually a good place to start. Um, however, we also learned that we had to adjust and fine tune the induction journey as we went along. Um, the, uh, the conditions were set by the senior generation uh, was that the, the next generation had a deep understanding of the, of the core business. And it was so important for us to start at the lowest level um, and learning and progressing to sort of uh, earn the credibility and trust from the team members and the professional management. Um, and I had to sit at the machine and learn what it takes to sew glass and panties. I mean, it's just like uh, something that I've uh, never done that before. Um, that's, when I, that's when I kind of realized that Victoria's Secret was just a glamorous product and a name, but, but there was a lot of hard work, dedication, and attention to detail that went into servicing the brand. Um, at, at, at the back end um, at manufacturing operations. Um, so I think immediately um, after joining the business, I had a lot of uh, profound respect for the team members where I learned what it really takes to, um, uh, what, what, what it really means to have commitment and trust on the shop floor as well. So it kind of like made me realize that a large manufacturing company in, in a large manufacturing company, there are three most important aspects that I would always keep in mind, which is the people, the product, and the process. Um, so uh, while, while, while I was happy with the family business induction program in Sri Lanka, I was always treated like the owner's son. Um, and I did not want to be treated. Um, I, 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 did not, I did not want to be treated differently. So I kind of just wanted to prove myself. Uh, so, that's, so that's when I learned the, that there was a new opportunity that opened up at a startup plant in Indonesia, uh, where I wanted to learn the production uh, from, from one of the best resources that we have uh, on the ground. So, um, so I just, I just uh, shipped myself over to Indonesia and spent two years, uh, two years at, the, at the factory learning the new language and so on. Um, then 
after, after completing that stint, then I came back to Sri Lanka and I realized that I needed, to, I needed to complete the cycle of the whole induction process, which, which included design, sourcing, product development, um, manufacturing and shipping in order to earn the respect um, in, in the family business. And so I think, well, first of all, I just want to, I'm not sure if everyone actually heard this, um, but Kunal said that he went to Indonesia and he learned the local language. And I know because he told me this, um, first of all, you, you may have figured out these guys are unbelievably humble, um, but <clears throat> both of them, but, but you, um, but what he shared with me when we first talked about this is that he learned the local language so he could communicate with the employees there and understand them. Um, so that, that I, I don't think I have to explain anymore. That, that says so much. Um, and, and the other thing, Kunal, that you've shared with me is that from the perspective of the, the, the you know, this company has you know, tremendous senior leadership, non-family senior leadership team. Um, and you've shared with me that, you know, from, you know, from their, from that perspective, the expectation was that you would take a particular track of, um, you know, working your way up in the company kind of through the management ranks to, um, you know, take whatever role you, you may take in the future. Um, and, but, but you wanted to take a different path. Um, and, and, and I'd love to hear why. why. Why did you not want to take, you know, take that path that was expected of you? Well, um, that, that's actually a good uh, tough question. Um, I was, I think, I think um, just after being in the business for three years, I kind of realized that I did not want to get bogged down with the details and the mundane task in the merchandising and the supply chain aspect of the business. So that's when I realized that sometimes you just got to uh, suck it up and learn to do the dirty work sometimes. So, um, and that was like the moment of realization. And then, um, then I had a, a series of uh, reflection myself as well, um, that this business is well run by professional management and they were doing a good job. Um, so the traditional path of slowly moving up the leadership ladder was something that was uh, not attractive for me. So it was then I realized that I needed to create a path of my own within MAS and, uh, and find a way to create, uh, create a meaningful value uh, and contribution to the company rather than just being an owner's son um, at the company. So um, going back to 12 years ago, uh, all the way back in 2008, um, when I was at Babson, um, I was actually intrigued to understand the whole concept of startups and entrepreneurship and uh, what it really means to run something of your own. Um, and so we did this uh, FME course, which I'm not sure if some of, some of the students have um, heard about it. It's called the Foundations of Management and Entrepreneurship, which was uh, there at the time. And uh, we, were, we were tasked to run, to, to run a startup brand that was selling sweatshirts and boxers across the campuses around the Boston area. And I was in operations and um, I had to find suppliers for small, small order quantities. Um, so this was an excellent practical learning of entrepreneurship, um, which made me realize that as a family business in the apparel manufacturing, we needed to sort of um, embark on a journey in supporting small brands with smaller volumes, right? So, um, so about three to four years ago, in 2017, um, I, I think we all noticed that there was an acceleration in the digital businesses um, and the ever-changing market landscape uh, of, of, of the brands made me realize that this was actually a great timing and opportunity for MAs to tap into the space. Right. So for me, um, I was actually quite fortunate to have a great mentor. And uh, I just, you know, just decided to put my hand up and say, look, I'm just uh, willing to take the lead and try this uh, new business forward for the company. Yeah. So, so, you know, you guys uh, who were on the call in the very beginning, you might remember this sort of three circle model that I showed. Um, and you know, one of the circles is um, self-reflectivity. So part of what we you know, heard Kunal say is that he, he really understood himself well enough to be able to identify that he didn't want to take the traditional and expected path 
to, um, to grow into business. There was something different that he wanted and, and he very successfully navigated to be able to take the path that, um, that, he, that he wanted to take, which, which turns out is a, a mission critical path actually for the business and maybe even more mission critical than was, um, I would say was, was, you know, was initially identified. So to tell us, Quinnell, about, um, about Runway Kid and what, what, this, what this startup is all about. Oh, it's, uh, it's actually uh, certainly a very tough um, beginning um, because it's all about changing the mindsets. Um, so uh, before, I get, before I get into that, let me just give you a bit of a background about MAS. Um, MAS as a family business is built on a very strong foundation of strategic partnerships uh, with large brands like Nike, Victoria's Secret, Little Lemon, and Coming Climb. Um, whom we've been very successful with in the last 25, 30 years. And so with the rise in digital technologies and the whole new wave of startups and smaller brands that, uh, that just came in over the last couple of years, we kind of like realized that there was a massive gap to be filled in the company. And none of the professional management or the professional leadership really understood what it really means to engage with all with, with the smaller brands. Um, because, because we at MAS, we also had some level of engagement with smaller brands over the last 10 years in the past, but we kind of struggled to get that off the ground um, because we realized that there was a lot of attention, uh, resources that needed to be, we needed, needed to be, we needed to put in place um, to service those brands. And subsequently, we also realized that these brands themselves also struggle to work with us as a manufacturer, because uh, for a large company as we expanded over the last 30 years, we put in a lot of uh, principles, a lot of processes, systems, and practices into place. So that was not quite working out in terms of how image was servicing. Uh, these smaller brands. So what, what we did was at, at Runway Kid was we created a digital, a, a user-friendly digital platform uh, to seamlessly connect business passion entrepreneurs with our factories in providing dedicated support. Um, so this new manufacturing business model offers smaller order runs from design to sampling to do uh, low low manufacturing order orders um, of, of of the value chain. So we kind of like leveraged on our digital technologies like virtual virtual ready made collections, virtual prototypes, um, and a seamless communication dashboard um, that keeps the customers and the factory teams uh, engaged and staying on track with what's happening with their start developments. So it's kind of important uh, for a manufacturer to look at the lens of what it really means to be agile, um, what flexibility means, um, uh, how, do you, how does one get into a point of speedy decision making, um, and most importantly, understanding the importance of uh, what it means to service these brands. Because I, I feel like, uh, especially in our culture, people always underestimate the importance of service, um, service in the smaller brands. So it's a whole different uh, new mindset and uh, skill set. So um, it's kind of, so for me, in the space that I'm in, it's kind of working like in a startup, but within the existing family business ecosystem, um, because we were able to leverage on uh, manufacturing experts um, resources and people within within the ecosystem. So uh, we we pitched the idea to the family, uh, presented to the board, um, and and we were given the approval to to go ahead with our project. Um, I had to follow the standard project and budgeting process um, as well. So I think at the beginning, like three to four years ago, it was such a great, humbling experience to be part of the journey. Um, because it really enabled me to build a strong foundation, which really helped me to build the credibility um, 
and confidence uh, both professionally and personally because because this is a large professional organization where you actually know that you may not be the best um, but you actually learn from uh, other other professional experts in the industry so it was actually not not easy to work on this concept um, at the beginning because we we had to leverage on the concept of design thinking uh, which we had to understand the important pain points of the entrepreneur and understand the pain points of the manufacturer right and then come up with a cohesive solution together um, that benefits both parties so that we can meet the expectations of both parties um, no, so it's kind of yeah. One of, sorry, one of, one of the things you share with me that might just illustrate this point is that um, you know you, you have factories who are used to getting orders for one million pieces, and now you ask them to take an order for one hundred pieces, and this is so. And this is a this is a huge mindset um, shift. But I think that one thing that we often see is that um, if you're at Babson, I'm, I mean, we often see is that you know the the one of the most significant advantages that family businesses have is this capacity to tap into the life experience and vision of the up and coming generation um, and the things that they see that are opportunities, um, things that are going to be shifting and changing. And so, you know, I see this with, you know, Canal's vision, the round runway kit and the changes that you've described to me that are happening in, in the industry where um, order sizes are decreasing for everyone that, you know, the you know, online retail is increasing, which means you know, more smaller brands and how you know, your um, uh, leadership in, in, in establishing Runway Kit creates a pathway for the whole organization to be able to be uh, better positioned to address the, the changing market. Absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry. I think it's. Um, Take yourself off mute, Ajay. You're on mute. Yeah, I just want to butt in for a minute. You know, Airs has been, like you said, we were a successful business. We had a great leadership team and we had great customers. The way I see it, and to put it bluntly, we were becoming fat, dumb, and lazy. Right? And I think becoming a victim of our own success also. And I felt that the hunger was going. People were not hungry enough. You had a million units of business, Victoria Street of Wood. I mean, just imagine these numbers. We were shipping out 250 million panties a year. Two hundred and about a hundred million bras a year. Almost about a hundred million Nike sweatshirts a year. So the numbers were phenomenal, huge. So nobody wanted to work on this hundred piece orders. So Kunal had to fight his way to uh, get his business going. So it was really tough for him. And I think that next generation in our family came in at the right time. Because the senior gen had done whatever they could do and had worked extremely hard and fatigue had set in also, I think. But the next gen that came in, came in with a lot of energy, a lot of new ideas, a lot of new thinking. And also we knew that the business needed to move to another space. So this genre kit probably came at the right time too. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, what Kunal says is right, it was a huge mindset shift. Because you are a successful business, why do you want to go and bother to do a small 100 piece business? Nobody wanted to do that. So it's tough, you may be the owner's son, you may be a shareholder, but nobody wants to take their business. <laughs> you have to fight. <laughs> so I think, I think, I think, um, I probably should, uh, Karen, maybe we can show the slides with the kind of questions and the um, 
answers, because I know I saw someone ask if there could be a kind of summary of some key points. So I think we're at um, 1056, because we, we could talk about Ajay and all for probably two or three more hours and not run out of things to talk about. Um, but I'm going to do just a kind of quick summary of where we are now, and then we'll, uh, for folks who want to, you know, uh, drop off, and then we'll, we'll continue with some questions um, afterwards. So, so these, so these are my own personal thoughts of what I, what I learned um, from Ajay's story that, you know, that could be helpful in a family startup. And can you just go through the, for the, to the first point, please, Carmen? So one is you're building on the families. I'm calling it IP, the knowledge of the family, the connections of the family. Do a startup that is on the edge of, of, where, of, the, of the existing family business. You can go to the next one, Carmen. Okay. Um, identify what each person is best at. Divide responsibilities and be respectful of each person's area of expertise. Identify your family's core values and guideposts. Of course, this is, do we, are we doing the right thing, which I love? Develop your common wording around that and let those values be your decision framework. Set aside your ego in favor of your shared goals. Probably the most important thing, I think. And the last, set up, the, set up a regular safe space of communication session just with the family. So that, the, so that the family has that space to work out challenges and problems in a space that's safe, a safe space to respectfully share. Okay, and, the, and, and here's what I learned from Kunal's story that I think is helpful in um, creating an, an entrepreneurship startup. Work outside the business first. So you see new ideas. And of course, Kunal got that at Babson. He also worked at a, at a startup in Boston before he went back to Sri Lanka. So gain some startup experience. Have a, have a sense of what a startup is like. Get to know your legacy business first. That journey of appreciation where you're building trust, which then builds uh, respect for yourself. So before you try and change something, first understand what it is. Identify what legacy business resources that the startup can leverage. Identify your success metrics and, and reporting lines. Again, identify the opportunities that are either at the edge, something different. In this case, at the edge of the business was this, uh, th this idea of servicing small brands. This was what, it, what was at the edge of the business in Kunal's case. So I'd love it if- um, Laurie, can I, in Kunal's yes, case, what yes, was please. also important was that he had to also go through the standard procedure of a business approval, uh, business, uh, you analyze the business approval and have business approval and budget the entire project. That was very important. You don't just put up a proposal and get the money. You have to show that you will be profitable in three years. There were some guidelines and he had to tick the boxes too. Yeah, it's not the story about ticking the boxes, but it's also about how, the how, it, how, how, how do you validate certain hypotheses because you've created hypotheses and assumptions, right? So you just sort of have to ensure that you come up with certain metrics to validate certain initiatives that are doing in your business. So, so this is so this is a rigorous process where the venture capital firm is the family and the, and the existing business. It's not just a, a blank check to just try something, which is which is important. Absolutely. Um, so, so I'd love to see, and Benjamin, I know you've been monitoring the chat. I don't know if anyone had a, 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 any questions um, in the chat that people, that we should um, bring forward. Yeah, Laura, we had um, just comments back and forth, but Elizabeth just posted a question. So I wanted to see if she wanted to ask it live. L Elizabeth, can you unmute yourself? Sure. And then let's go to Sasha after. Um, so my question was, uh, what aspect of your family startup impacted you the most i mean like for better or for worse um i'm sure there's plenty of those little stories that you have from your long-standing business time you're on you're on mute ajay yeah if you look at our senior gen business i think one of the first things you need to understand is nothing comes easy you have to work your butt off 
you have to work extremely hard and there are some sacrifices to be made too so that's one of the first lessons you will learn if it's your business it's your money and you have put everything into it you have to work extremely hard to ensure that this business is going to be successful I mean, I remember I used to wake up at two in the morning, leave Colombo at three in the morning, have a five hour drive to one of our plants. It was out in the villages. There was not even a place where I could stop in and have a cup of coffee. I had to take everything with me. I had to take my lunch with me at that three o'clock in the morning. And I get home by 12 in the night. Right, and I did that every alternate week for several years. But because I was running that plant, that was five hours away. It was in a farmland kind of place. And uh, my brother on the other hand, was running a plant in Chennai, in India, South India. He used to take an eight o'clock flight. So he didn't have to get up at three o'clock. He took an eight o'clock flight and took a five o'clock flight back again and he was home before me. He left after me. So each guy had to do his piece of work, right? Um, and uh, of course that was a much larger business, but hard work is one of the things that you have to be prepared to do. Big time, big time. Number two, trust and commitment. By trust, you don't mean financially. That's a given. But by trust, you mean that if you make a commitment, you will live up to it. That is what I mean by trust here. Okay? So that was absolutely, absolutely important. And you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. You lose that trust once, it's very difficult to make. I remember it's an interesting story. Um, our first order to Victoria's Secret. We were given an order of 12,000 units. And they said you, sh you manufacture and ship out 2,000 units. Send the workers home. Don't cut anything. We will receive the goods, inspect it, and then tell you to manufacture the next 2,000 pieces. That's the way we finished 12,000 pieces. My brother and I inspected every single piece of product going to Victoria's Secret. And that went on till late in the night. So it's a lot of hard work, a lot of commitment, and that element of trust is very important. That's great. Thank you, Ajay. Was there another question, Vegetan? Yes, let's um, go next to Sasha, and then let's go to Miles. Sasha, could you unmute yourself, please? So I have a family business, and there are two generations before me. And currently, there's a lot of pressure on my father and my grandfather due to de centralized decision making. So, like, what would you suggest to move away from the centralized decision making? Which one of you wants to take that, Kunal or Ajay? I can take that one. That's not a problem. See, I think as Kunal said, you have to also prove yourself. You need to understand that the core of the business is what gave you the profits. The core of the business is what gave you your education. The core of the business is giving you your lifestyle. So you need to understand the core of the business absolutely well. And that was one prerequisite that we had for the next gen. You have to spend three years in understanding the core of your business. So you need to understand the core. You need to build your own credibility in your organization so that people take you seriously. 
as against just walking in and saying, I don't believe in what you've done. I'm going to do something else myself. Is that what you mean by a central decision? No, actually what I meant was that my father and grandfather have a lot of pressure and like they take all the decision making. So they're not able to grow the business to, a, to the extent that they can if they delegate work. But then they're not very up to the idea of doing that. And now I've needed you again, Ajay. I'm sorry you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Ajay. Sorry. Let me tell you about one thing that I didn't mention so far. We built our business on partnerships. Okay. And we believe very strongly that we didn't have all the answers. And we needed partners to help us through this process. So we had American partners. They were very good at marketing. We had British partners who gave us the MS business. And they were very good in terms of financial discipline. We had German partners who taught us technology and they were very, very rigid and process driven. So from each of the partners, we were humble enough to learn from them. So uh, we believed in partnerships and those partnerships kind of forced us to hire professionals ourselves. Because when those partners came in for meetings, we had to have a professional team to talk on equal terms with those professionals from the other side. That's what brought professionals into our company, the partnerships. So um, if you get one good professional inside, and that person really helps. You need some support from the outside. That one individual person is your ally. And he helps you to strategize how you should approach this with your father or grandfather. See, it's their business and they have been really, very really successful. And they can't think otherwise. So you need to think through what will it take to convince them that we need outside help to augment and improve our thinking. Thank you, Ajay. That's great. And, and who, who is next, Benjapan? Okay, let's have Miles unmute and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really valuable. Um, I was just going to ask Kunal how much you're still involved with MAS and like how do you allocate your focus and energy between MAS and Runway Kit? That could be, uh, you could just talk about now or like the past few years that you just started Runway Kit, um, either way. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, actually, this was a good exercise that we did that a couple of months ago to figure out our time allocation um, because we also realized that uh, we, this five days a week, we can't obviously be at all aspects of the business. Um, so we just had to figure out what were in our best interest and what were in our uh, capabilities that would actually serve us best to be um, to be involved in, in certain parts of the business. But uh, to your question, um, there was some certain ownership, um, high level conversations that we had to be involved in um, that required uh, some high level decisions. Um, and I mean, I, 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 would, I, would, I would actually spend about like 80 to 85% of my time at Runway Kit because that's something that is my passion, my interest, um, and the space that I would actually have more my time uh, to carve out in that space and manage my team, manage the customers and so on. But with MAS, it's mostly news, it's usually um, on strategy, conversations, um, uh, conversations that involves the large customers or some uh, deep issues that we have, or even uh, being involved in COVID, COVID issues that we need to be we needed to update ourselves on what's going on. So it's kind of, um, I would say, a function of 
85% uh, uh, of my time at Vanvi Kid, and maybe 15% of my time on the ownership aspects of Renews. And that has been working out fine. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's it's uh, it's been a bit of a challenge because you can't really come up with you can't say like okay, uh, there's uh, forty five hours in a week. You can't be like okay, um, I have like thirty five hours for one week, kid, and maybe the balance ten hours for emirates. But it's you just have to kind of figure out um, what is important to you. You can actually have the power of saying no to decline some of the high level meetings if you can. Deeper, and do we, I think we have time maybe for one more question, Benjamin. All right, so let's go to Christopher next. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask a question to AJ um, and how you will make sure that the family business passes through generations and how the, um, and also how you've adapted through the pandemic and what kind of things have changed. You're on mute. Sorry, what was the first part of your question? So how you will make sure that your family business will move on to the next generations and what kind of measures or steps you take in that, in that direction? Okay, so we actually started with the family charter. And the family charter has very clear guidelines about how one has to behave in a family and a family business too. So as Kunal and the next gen were graduating out of college, they knew that they had to graduate out of college, spend three years working outside and then come and join the business. And they had to spend three years in the business, understanding the core of the business before they can venture to do anything else. So some sort of guidelines was in place because of the charter that we had planned. So that was very important. It was a defining moment for us, the family charter. And it really told you about the business, about the next gen, about who can join the business, who cannot join the business. Is it a business with male lineage? Is it open to the because a lot of Asian businesses are very male lineage businesses. Many European businesses are too. But for us, it was very clear. Whether we had sons or daughters, we gave them the same exposure, same education, same exposure. And both had the same opportunity to come and join the business. We were very clear about that. So, um, uh, and... Uh, yeah, so it, those principles were in place and uh, we did have challenges with the next generation too. Um, not everything that we planned went according to plan. So, um, and I'm sure Kunal and the other guys have uh, had a lot of issues with the next gen issues with also working with a professional leadership team. So on our Thursday meetings, we now what have what we call an ownership council meeting where the next gen can come and voice any issues that they have, any sort of blocks in their progress or challenges that they are facing or even sometimes the ideas that they have for the business or for themselves. So it's an open forum for us to discuss as a family, as, as ownership members of the family, a closed door meeting. So it that, gives them an opportunity. I think yeah. unfortunately, very sadly, we are um, at time. So, um, I, I, I regret that I have to wrap this session up. Um, but as you can see, of course, I'd love to uh, have these guys back again because there, there's so many aspects actually of their, of their business that 
we had no time to talk about today, which is their approach towards sustainability and uh, their approach towards women's, uh, women's empowerment. Um, there are so, so many fascinating things in addition to um, other topics related to what we had today. So maybe, maybe we'll have them back again. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I just want to say that, first of all, um, th they have very kindly offered to respond in uh, via email to any questions that we weren't able to get to today. So you will, uh, you'll, get, you'll get a response to your question, even if we didn't have time to address it. I also saw that some people asked about the slides. So we will send the slides out, and Ajay's giving me a correction to one of them, so we'll make that first. Um, and then we'll, we'll get the slides out. Um, and I just, um, and, and I actually, I, I actually just want to say one last thing as I wrap up, which is that um, these guys are, they're, they're so generous. Both Ajay and Kunal are, are mentors to um, two Babson students and have both so, they've so generously given up their time. Um, and I, I'm not sure how many people who run $2 billion companies uh, you know, spend time, um, volunteer to spend time, you know, with, with a student. And it's been, it's been actually quite inspiring for me um, to um, to see that, so we'll we'll um, set that as a uh, as as a role model and, and, and as an example. Um, so Thank I want to thank um, all of you for coming today, and particularly Ajay and Kunal. Um, and thank you so much for um, fabulous session. See you all again today. Thank, thank you so you. much for having us over. Thank, thank you so you. much, uh, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day or great evening, wherever you are. Okay. You. I love how I, I just like chilling with his wine. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. It's not 11 a.m. in Sri Lanka. It's a fireside chat. It's a fireside yeah, exactly. chat. So it's uh, 9 30 p.m. Oh, over here. Let's <laughs> enjoy a glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. It was great. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.